hope everyone's having a good day. I hope everyone had a good afternoon. It was nice maybe to get a little downtime, right? Just, uh, okay, let's show of hands. Let's do a quick poll. How many uh, took some extra time to pray? How many took a nap? How many took a walk? Just enjoy I mean, like, seriously, this is like one of the seven days where the sun shines and there's no clouds in the sky that we get every year. So you are here at the right day. God has blessed us with some wonderful weather because we didn't have much of a spring this year. It seemed like it was like 40 degrees every day and all of a sudden it was like 80 degrees. And to have it go back down to the 70s and not be too humid, a true, a true blessing. And to have such a sunny day, God is so good. And so um, we're just going to enter in. Uh, this is the second session of the Life of the Spirit. And this Life in the Spirit, uh, you know, yesterday I talked about it being this this all-encompassing experience. It's not just a one-off kind of retreat or a seminar that we go through and can check the box, saying, okay, did that, received the, that grace. What's next? What else you got for me? You know, truly, life in the Spirit is the gift that God has given each one of us and has given the church to animate all that we do, from our evangelistic work to our transformation to becoming more like Jesus. Uh, but today, I, I do want to talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit. And then at the end, we're going to take some time just to uh, surrender and empty ourselves. You know, St. Mother Teresa, uh, and I think I might have shared this yesterday, one of my favorite saints for her is, God can only fill that which is empty. So if we want to receive more grace, the question is, what are we letting go of? What is in us that needs to go so that there's more space within us? And not only that, but, but to ask the Lord to expand the capacity of our hearts to receive him. And I think God wants to come very near to us in a very intimate way and breathe his life into us to restore and to renew and refresh our spirits. But our cooperation with that movement is absolutely essential, as it is with the grace of any sacrament. And as I said yesterday, life in the Spirit has its roots. Everything flows from our baptism. So what we are asking for is a renewal and also a, a new effusion, a new outpouring of the grace of our baptism as we move forward together. And we're really blessed today because John Paul's here. Everyone wave at John Paul. He's behind the piano. He's a, this is a man of many, many talents. He plays the guitar. He plays the piano. I've even seen him play the radio in his car, and he's pretty good at that. So uh, <laughs> we're lucky to have him with us this afternoon. He's going to lead us in a song of just bringing our hearts our focus back upon the Lord and uh, his spirit. So why don't we all stand together and just spend a few minutes worshiping the Lord and, and giving and putting ourselves in the Lord's presence. Jesus, we praise you. We bless you. Jesus, we praise your holy name. Jesus, thank you for your presence. Lord, we ask you to please bless this time together. Send your Holy Spirit down in a powerful way. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here.
welcome. You welcome in this place. You welcome in this place. You welcome in this place, Jesus. You welcome in this place. You welcome in this place. You welcome in this place. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. With our hearts, Lord. Have your way. Have your way. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out. Shout out and bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out. Shout out and bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and let all that's within me Shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out, and have your way, have your way, have your way. God. I just want to invite us, you know, to, to sing a song together is one thing, but the, I love the, the song where, where, where David cries out, let's sing a new song to the Lord. I think one of the gifts that the Spirit gives us is the ability to worship God from the heart. And it's only when we can let go of what might be blocking us in our minds and just be free as children to adore and praise God that the Spirit is continually released in a deeper way in our lives. I believe that through this experience, this time together, the Lord wants to put a new song in our hearts. A song that no one's ever sung before because it's your song given to you by the Spirit to honor and glorify God, to worship Him from a depth of spirit, from, from deep within. And so John Paul's just going to continue to play for the next couple minutes. We're, I'm just going to invite you as the Spirit leads you you can either say it or sing it, however you want to do it, just to, to speak the praise that's in your heart to God. To not be afraid, not to be worried about, am I saying it right? Am I singing it right? Do I have a good enough voice to sing like this for God? You know, one of the gifts of the Spirit that I think uh, was misinterpreted uh, in our church through the 70s, 80s, and even up to now is a lot of people have learned to sing without moving their lips which is pretty amazing, but I like old school singing where we actually open our mouths and noise comes out, and even if it's off key, the Lord delights in it. If you're like, I'm ashamed of my voice, I don't sing the best, you know what? It doesn't matter. Because if you don't, if God doesn't like it, he'll change it, all right? Miraculously make you sound like Pavarotti or something. Like, but if for now, he delights in it. He's just happy to hear you sing from the heart. So we're just going to ask John, John Paul to, to, to say, have, sing that have your way again. And then we'll just break into some spontaneous words of love for our Lord, whatever the Spirit puts on your heart. Just come, Holy Spirit. Let us sing a new song unto the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus. Glory to your holy name, Lord God. Have your way. Have your way. Have your way. We want to sing a song for you, Lord. Have your way. Have your way. We give you our hearts, Lord. Have your way. Come, Holy Spirit, we love you. Come, Holy Spirit. 
Holy Spirit, we adore you. Jesus, we praise you. We glorify you. We love you, Lord. Have your way. We love you, Jesus. Praise to you, Lord God, our King. We give you our hearts, Lord. Praise your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we adore you. Holy is your name, O Lord. We love you, Jesus. I love you, Lord, my God and King. I give you my heart of praise. All the praise and glory that's to your name, O Lord. We sing out our hearts to you, O Lord. We love you, Jesus. Holy is your name, Lord God. Praise your mighty name. Holy is your name, O Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Holy is your name, O Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God. We praise, we worship, and exalt you, Jesus. We love you, Lord God. Just tell the Lord you love him. We love you, Jesus. We welcome you, Holy Spirit, to fall upon us now. Have your way, Spirit. You are the master. You want to form the interior man. You want to strengthen us, the inner man. You want to pour into us boldness and courage, confidence in who you are a new sense of hope, a new sense of trust, a deeper faith to believe in the miracles that you want to do in us and through us. We say yes to all of this, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Thank you, Jesus. We praise you. And together we pray, all glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All righty. Anyone here from Chicago or have ever lived in the Chicago area? All righty. People from Chicago love Chicago in a way that people who aren't from Chicago don't understand. I have a cousin that lives in Chicago. I love going down to, uh, you know, the... Up and down, uh, I grew up in Upper Michigan, so I grew up half an hour from Lake Superior, half an hour from Lake Michigan. And so the Great Lakes are an important part of my life. I love going back up there. I'm leaving uh, on the 29th to spend a week with my dad, and my, my brothers, and my sister up there, vacationing. My grandmother, when she passed away, left us the house that she grew up in. She remodeled it, fixed it up, made it a, like a little summer home, uh, and it's right on the, the, the bay in Grand Marais, Michigan in a little village of 400 people. Has a gas station, a hardware store, a grocery store, and a craft brewery that makes the most amazing blueberry wheat beer because they use fresh blueberries that grow up in the Upper, upper Peninsula. So I'm going to eat whitefish and pasties for a week and drink a lot of blueberry wheat beer with my family and just enjoy the beauty of God. But for people from Chicago, you know, like you got to get your classic Chicago hot dog, your Chicago deep dish pizza. There's food everywhere. But for me, you know, when I, when I think about Chicago, I think about the, the year uh, 1871. Does anyone remember what happened in 1871? I'm looking at you guys from Chicago. Yes, the Great Chicago Fire. What's interesting about the Great Chicago Fire is that it started, you know, if everyone knows that the, uh, the, uh, the, the Chicago River flows down through the, the middle of the city. And at the time, in 1871, the, 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 the river would turn and flow into Lake Michigan. But this river was also where all the slaughterhouses were. It was also the river in which most people dumped their, their waste and so in around the late 1800s, the Chicago River was really nothing more than a boggy, you know, flow of slow-moving bog of sewage. I've actually seen pictures of ducks standing on the surface of the river, and they called it the Stinky River because it was so bad. When the fire broke out, it broke out on the lakeside, but it spread because the surface of the river actually caught on fire because of all the fat and waste and disgusting stuff that was in the river, and it spread to the rest of the city. Yeah, even after uh, 10 years after the Chicago fire was, uh, had, had uh, 
burned itself out, you know, and they had rebuilt and so much. You know, there, there was nearly 100,000 people had died from illnesses carried by the diseases in the river. And they were even considering what to do with the city. There was, there was talk of even shutting down the entire city, maybe even moving it away because it wasn't sustainable because the river was flowing with all the sewage into Lake Michigan, right? And that was where the intake for all the water supply from the city was coming from. So all the sewage was flowing from where they were drawing the water that they were supposed to live off of. And it was polluted and diseased and filthy and putrid. And, and it could have been the, the end of the city until an amazing group of engineers came up with a plan. And they built a number of dams and locks on the part of the river that connected the river to Lake Michigan and actually changed the flow so that now water would be flowing into the river. But where was it going to flow? Well, they built a 28-mile canal from the downtown Chicago down to the Des Plaines River uh, that then flows into the Illinois River and then into the Mississippi and then down to the Gulf of Mexico. They literally changed the flow of, of, of the, that river in order to save the city. I mean, they, it took years and years to build. They, they, they moved tons and tons. It was, at the time, it was the, the largest engineering feat done in the country. And they did it all because they had to reverse the flow. They had to save the city. And when they were done, fresh water was flowing in and cleaning out all the sewage. They also put in new restrictions on what could be dumped in the water. They did a, a, an amazing job turning the whole city around. And now it's, it's the magnificent city that we know that it is. And when I read this story online, you know, like I, was, I was very fascinated by it. And it reminded me of Ezekiel 47, chapter 47 where the Lord comes to Ezekiel and he shows him this image of water flowing from the temple. And this is what the Lord says to Ezekiel. He says, son of man, have you seen this? And he led him to the banks of the river. And he said, the water flows towards the eastern region and goes down into Arabah. And when it enters the stagnant waters of the sea, the water will become fresh. And wherever the river goes, every, little, every living creature which swarms will live and there will be very many fish for this water goes there that the waters of the sea may become fresh. So everything will live where the river goes. And this is where I, what I'm really thinking, like when we talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit, you know, we are constantly bombarded by a world that's under the control of an enemy that what seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. Destroy your relationship with Christ, kill your joy, rob you of your sense of purpose to constantly discourage you and hold you down. And, and, and God wants to reverse that flow in each one of our lives. You know, the, that, that grace of the baptism needs to be joined by a, a new flow to move our hearts, to take what is dead in us and make it come alive so that wherever the Spirit enters into us, it touches, becomes alive and produces fruit. And not only for us, but for the people that we serve. For those of you who are priests through your priestly ministry, for those of you who are deacons through your ministry as a deacon, for those of you who are in seminary, who are preparing to be priests. This is what it all is all about, is allowing this flow of grace to flow in you and through you. It's come, you know, the simple belief that I've come to learn through my own faults and my own foibles in ministry is ministry is not, nothing more than the overflow of what you first let the Lord do in your own life. And if you are generous in the way you let the Lord work in you, you will have an abundance of grace to overflow in the lives of those that you serve. And so the call for us, as much as it is to go forth, is to yield, to let God first have his way in us so that then he can do his will through us. And when we talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit, that's exactly what we're referring to, that yielding that allowing that, that, that spring of grace that was poured into us at baptism, the graces that we got through confirmation, the graces that we received through every Eucharist we've ever celebrated and, and been a part of, to well up in us, to, for, to change the flow of who we are, to bring life to this world. You know, the term baptism in the Holy Spirit is controversial because a lot of people say, well, we have baptism. It's a sacrament. It's one of the big seven. It's the one that takes you from being a pink little pagan as a baby and makes you a child of God. It does everything that you need to have happen. It gives you this outpouring of grace, this sanctifying grace, this, this dynamic, always with you grace that is there to sanctify and you make, make you like the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So why is it necessary for us to talk about baptism in the Holy Spirit as another thing? It confuses people. Is there another expression we can use? I would, I would propose that we don't need to look for another expression to talk about what, we're, what we mean when we say baptism in the Holy Spirit, but look at the words of Scripture and what have been affirmed by different saints and popes throughout our time. Jesus starts talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, when he says, I've come to cast fire upon the earth, and I wish that it were already kindled. Even as Jesus thinks about his work as Redeemer, he knows that his work is completed with the coming of the Holy Spirit, that the final phase of our, our kind of our religion, and religion is a word in the Latin, just means to, you know, the ligament, the connector. That's why the, the L-I-G in religion is the same L-I-G that we use when we talk about the ligaments that connect our muscles to our bones. The last part of our reconnection to God, the last part of our religion is God's spirit then being manifested and poured into our hearts in a dynamic way. Not resting upon us like it did in the Old Testament, but indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus sees this as casting fire. In Acts chapter 1, some of the last words he says to his apostles before he ascends is, he says, while meeting with them, he enjoined them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father about which you've heard me speak. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So baptism in the Holy Spirit is a biblical phrase that signifies this coming of the Holy Spirit upon us. And, and, he, and he goes, he completes his thoughts when he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, through Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And have we not seen the fulfillment of these words? The church is everywhere. The universal presence of the church preaching the gospel to all nations. It's funny because like he says in Matthew chapter 28, go. But before you go, you got to wait. And doesn't that seem like they're, they're, we're in this constant tension between, okay, I've, I've got to go, there's things to do, there's work to be done, but I've got to wait upon the Lord. This waiting upon the Lord is so vital for we have to be equipped and empowered to, before we can go. We need to receive. St. John the 23rd in, in, in the launching Vatican II said, renew your wonders in our time as through a new Pentecost. His prayer for the church was there would be a new Pentecost, a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. And we saw this spring up where, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're literally an hour from what, what is considered and is got ground zero for the charismatic renewal of the Catholic Church in America, the Ark and Dove. And if you haven't had, if you've never had a chance to visit the Ark and Dove, I highly recommend you go there. And if you have an extra hour or two on Friday, you know, before you have to drive home and if you can make the trip, go there and just there's a, there's a special spirit that's upon that place. And some of the priests who are here from the, uh, the Diocese of Pittsburgh will tell you that it is their go-to place for refreshment, renewal, and retreat. And this, this, this renewal, this renewal that started there is spread across the country now. There are millions of people who have been, who've received baptism in the Holy Spirit and are living out their life in the Spirit in a more dynamic way because of it. St. John Paul II, in looking at the renewal, and, you know, he had the ability to, to, to see it from its infancy and its formation and into the 80s and into the 90s. He, this is what he said. He said, the institutional and charismatic aspects are coessential, as it were, to the church's constitution. It is from this providential rediscovery of the church's charismatic dimension that before and after the council, a remarkable pattern of growth has been established for ecclesial movements and new communities. It's so amazing that, you know, like, I love how he says this. The institutional, the sacramental life of the church, it's like one lung that needs to be breathing deeply. We need to be going to the, to the sacrament of reconciliation. We need the Eucharist. We need our ongoing rootedness in the sacraments of the church. But there's also this charismatic lung that needs to be deep, uh, uh, breathing deep, deeply with. So for the human to be, uh, you know, 100% healthy, we need two healthy lungs. For the church to be healthy, we need two healthy lungs, one breathing deeply of the institutional grace in those channels and another breathing as the Spirit wills and, and, and as he graciously provides this grace, we receive it. And I love what he says. He goes, it's, 
a providential rediscovery. It wasn't an invention. It wasn't a watering down of pure Catholicism. It was a rediscovery of a pattern of living that was first lived out by the early apostles in the Acts of the Apostles. And it's not, been, it's not like it's, it happened, ended with the Acts of the Apostles and was rediscovered in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. There had been many uh, times of great renewal. There were times when you know, the monks would record that they would be chanting their prayers and at, at the end of the, the formal chant, the written chants that they would pray together, they would continue to chant in tongues as the Spirit was moving through them, that their, 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 their communal prayer left, led to communal praying in tongues in a very beautiful way. And this was springing forth in different religious communities across the world at different times. But I think it really came to life you know, for, for us in this modern day because the Lord knew that we would need special graces to meet the challenges that we're facing right now as individuals trying to live pure, holy lives in an impure, unholy world, and to lead and build and renew a church that has suffered from internal decay and external attack. I mean, it, it, there's no doubt that our enemy is strong when 70% of Catholics claim, don't, don't have a clear understanding that they don't believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. That's, that's diabolical deception. That's scales over the eyes kind of stuff. You know, that, that's a, uh, you know, a, a falling down of, of the lies of the enemy that have blinded people to see who Jesus truly is. Could you imagine if every baptized Catholic had an encounter with Jesus Christ where they understood that in that tiny white host was, every, was the fulfillment of every one of their hopes and dreams, and they built their life upon the worship and reception of that, and everything else in their life became secondary to that singular pursuit of loving Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament? What would our church look like if that was the case? I believe, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm totally optimistic, you know, that, that God is going to do something amazing, that the best days of the church are not behind us. You know, God did not lead us this far to say, okay, guys, I'm sorry, it's, the, the grace has run out, last one out the door, turn the lights off, all right? And it's been fun, we've had a good run, let's, 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 let's fold up our tents and go home. Now, I believe that the Lord is still going to work in power. And I think his, his grace and power are going to be revealed even more so as we courageously and bravely say yes through the power of the Holy Spirit to meet the challenges that rise before us. That rise before us like the giant rose, Goliath rose before David. And David had to listen to them jeer and taunt and run down God and run down him. But in the end there was one person standing there holding the head of the other <laughs> for all to see. That's pretty B.A. I mean, like, ah, I got the head of the... Yeah, you think you, you're, you're God? You're going you're gonna to run me down? You think you're big? My God is bigger. And the beautiful thing about this life of the Spirit, this baptism of the Spirit, is we don't have to be strong. We just have to put our faith in a God that is ultimately strong. Pope Benedict XVI, he said, in effect... Jesus' whole mission was aimed at giving the Spirit of God to men and baptizing them in this bath of regeneration. And I love that because, you know, when, 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 we, when we look at the completion of Jesus' work as Savior in his hum humanity, and he dies upon the cross and he says, it is finished. It is the work of, of, of the Lamb of God. But he said, look, I'm not done yet. I'm going to send you a advocate. I'm going to send you this power. You will receive power when the advocate comes. You will be transformed when the advocate comes. Peter will become the rock. Everything that I said will happen, will happen. The promises that, you know, that the call I've put on your life, all the grace that you need to fulfill it will be given to you. Do not doubt, but wait and believe. And this was on the, the, the Regina Chalia of, of Pope Benedict XVI in May of 2018. And he concluded his comments to the audience to say, saying these words, Today I would like to extend the invitation to all. Let us rediscover, dear brothers and sisters, the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Once again, we hear that word, rediscover. 
Let's rediscover. Let's, let's find this treasure that's laid, laid hidden, you know. It's kind of like, all right, we're, we're kind of like the bumbling Nazis in Indiana Jones. We've come across the Ark of the Covenant. Do we dare open it? <laughs> you know? I mean, like, we've, we've rediscovered this amazing power. It stands before us. Do we have the courage to open our hearts and let it flood our lives? You know, to penetrate us. You know, if you've seen that movie, Indiana Jones, you know, the, where, where they open up the Ark of the Covenant and light starts shooting out. And it, you know, it's pretty, pretty graphic, but th- you see this light flying into people and they're like, wow. You know, and it's, it ends very badly for them, but it ends very well for us. <laughs> it's baptism in the Holy Spirit. But I love that. He says, let us rediscover the beauty of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. He, he, then he goes, let us recover. So he says, let us rediscover and let us recover awareness of our baptism and confirmation. Has anyone ever seen the movie Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis? He's dead the whole movie. I'm sorry if I just gave it away. If you haven't seen it yet, you deserve to have it spoiled for you. I'm sorry. Um, but that's the way most Catholics live. You know, it's like you're, at, you're I'm, I'm sure this is even more so for you as you're dispensing c- communion. I see dead people. They just don't know they're dead. You know, like their faith has not been activated. It's like they're, they're, we, we have this brand of zombie Catholic that shuffle through the motions out of habit that the Lord is looking at and saying, no, no, I want you to recover Eucharistic amazement. I want you to recover this idea that you're a child of God. I want you to rediscover that there's a strength given to you in your baptism and confirmation for you to change the world. I want the whole church to have this. I want everyone on fire. I wish that you were already rekindled, but it hasn't happened. Because in the normal flow of human events, we should receive these sacraments as children, and then we should have this grace fostered and nurtured and built up in us, and we, we will be taught well and prayed well with our parents. But that's just not the experience of most Catholics. The domestic church is in decay. Yesterday morning, I wasn't with you because I was just like 15 minutes down the road as Catholic family land. And there were like 750 people, family members there, celebrating the Eucharist. And I, and I, I spoke with them about the need for prayer. But, you know, but I see these Catholic families are looking to, they're struggling to striving to find their identity and maintain it. After I got done speaking, I talked to a woman her greatest ache right now in her life, and it's deep, a deep, deep wound, is her daughter just, she just completed a doctorate in transitional sexual identity. She now identifies, wants to be called they or them, not a he or a she, I'm a they, and has rejected everything about the Catholic faith. She won't come and have dinner with her family if they're serving meat because she thinks eating meat is cruel, and that's her line of morality. Abortion absolutely got to have lots of abortion but to eat a meat to put meat on your table is sin you know in her mind you talk about the blindness of of the enemy and his ability to deceive and pull souls into hell here on earth we have people who probably are more like mary magdalene than the mother of god more mary magdalene's running around men and women who are just under the influence of pure evil blinded by it and what we need are, is a church in, the, in, in imitation of our Lord and Savior that can cast out blindness, that can open the eyes of the blind, who are working on that level of power. Pope Francis himself, you know, he's been very challenging to the charismatic renewal because he says it's not good enough to just have a renewal if the renewal is not at the service of the church. And if the, if the renewal is not about helping other people discover this gift, then it's not really a renewal. And at the gathering of all the different uh, ecclesial bodies and movements of the church that, that, that operate in the power of the Holy Spirit and their leaders, he said, you, the charismatic renewal, have received a great gift from the Lord. Your movement's birth was willed by the Holy Spirit to be a current of grace in the church and for the church. It's the thing, you know, like, if you're going to be given this great gift of the Holy Spirit, it's not for you. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, every gift is given to one for the benefit of another. Like, we get gifts from the Lord, not so we can say, oh, look what I got from the Lord. He loves me. I'm special. You know, we're being activated to use those gifts to serve. And he goes on to say, he goes, what is the very first gift of the Holy Spirit? It's the gift of himself, the one who is love and makes us fall in love with Jesus. And that love changes our lives. That's why we speak of being born again in the Spirit. 
He finishes his remarks by saying, I expect you to share with everyone in the church the grace of baptism in the Holy Spirit. So once again, we need to understand that baptism in the Holy Spirit is an experience that has been given to the church to release and strengthen the effects of baptism and confirmation in our lives. It is a current of grace that transforms the human heart and forms the church. And when we look at the theology of our sacraments, we can also see a very clear understanding of why baptism in the Holy Spirit is so important. In the Catechism, in Article 1302, it says, it is evident from its celebration that the effect of the sacrament of confirmation is the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit as once granted to the apostles of the day of Pentecost. That's great. Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost? The room that they were in was filled with wind. Tongues of flame descended from heaven. They stepped outside, proclaimed the gospel. Peter stepped up, gave his first homily. 3,000 people entered into the church, became believers. They were speaking in tongues. There were all these signs and wonders, and conversion was happening because the Spirit was moving in such great power. I wonder if we've ever seen a confirmation ceremony at our churches that look even similar to that in any way, shape, or form. But the same grace, the same power that was poured out in the church on the day of Pentecost is what comes down and fills and is stirred up in the hearts of every young person. But that needs to be fostered. That needs to be, that there needs to be a personal response to that grace because we know that the sacraments are not magic. Dispensing the sacraments, you're not a magician. You're offering a gift. That gift needs to be received. That gift needs to be unwrapped. That gift needs to be used by every baptized Catholic so that they can become all that God made them to be. And if they choose to reject or not respond, either through sin or through negligence, we know that that's, that, that sacrament doesn't have its full effect. It says in 1127 in the catechism, it says, celebrated worthily in faith, the, sa the sacraments confer the grace that they signify. As fire transforms its, into itself everything it touches, so the Holy Spirit transforms into the divine life whatever is subjected to its power. And I would also add, he will transform whoever subjects themselves to his power, puts themselves humbly beneath the power of the Spirit, overshadowed, as it were, in imitation of our Blessed Mother, that's, that's not a posture that you enter into casually. To put yourself under the power of the Holy Spirit, to, put him, to be subject to his power, is an act of the will. The deepest parts of our heart need to be activated as we pursue the Holy Spirit. And most people are not there. Most people are not aware, have never, maybe never received the catechesis of needing to personally respond with a heartfelt yes. We know that there's two parts to every sacrament, God's part and our part. God's part is opus operantum. The promise that God says that when you, when you administer this sacrament in a licit and valid way, no matter what it is, the grace is there. So that's, that's a, a great relief for those of you who are priests, right? You may not be 100% right, right with the Lord, but every time that you get up and say the prayers, in a valid and licit way and dispense the sacrament of, recon of a sacrament of communion or reconciliation or whatever, marry somebody, grace is present because God, that's God's part. You're God's instrument to bring that grace. But the other part, which is just as important to the, to the, to the life of the church and, the, and the, to make these sacraments come alive is the opus operantis, the person receiving their part. That's where we're in the proper state of mind a proper state of receptivity, a proper state of the soul, namely free from mortal sin, our hearts and minds attuned to God, a will desirous of what God desires to give us in that sacrament. And when we line up who we are with what is happening in front of us, amazing things happen. When I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, the, the, the most important thing that happened to me was the mass came alive. If I had a dollar for every mass I received in, in such an ill state, and I'd be a rich person. The first 18 years of my life, going to mass, tuned out, unaware that there was a, a mystery, a heavenly banquet taking place, that if I had the eyes of faith, I would have seen the saints and angels praising God around the altar. 
You know, if we had these eyes of faith to see everything that's contained in the mystery of the holy sacrifice of the mass. So when it comes to baptism and confirmation, what is the operantis? What is our part? Well, number one, it's faith. We have to believe. We have to say yes to that. A faith that isn't just okay as a concept, but a move in my heart like saying, okay, God, I believe and I want what you have. That faith that becomes receptivity. I hunger for what hap is happening there. I want this. The third thing is we need to have a repentance of our sins, right? We can't let sin, sin is the only thing, our choice not to, let, not to go to confession can block God. God is such a respecter and lover of us that his free, free will for him is everything. He doesn't knock down the door. He knocks on the door. He waits for us to open it, to, 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 to enter in by invitation only. There's a door uh, you know, in your heart and it only opens from the inside. And God will never kick it down. And it's our surrender to that. And that's the hardest part. Just letting go. Doing a trust fall into the arms of God and saying, Spirit, have your way. And believing that our God is going to do something in us that, that will blow us away. That will make us more of what we were created to be. And we must be willing to respond. Um, in the Bible, there's, there's many different ways that people receive baptism in the Holy Spirit. And that's one of, the, one of the things I want to make very clear as I wrap things up, because we're going to turn our hearts to prayer here in a second, is that there's no algorithm for this. There's no formal process by which people receive this. This is the Spirit's work. You know, I've prayed with a lot of people to receive the Holy Spirit, but I've never seen, I've never been able to personally baptize anyone in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because that's Jesus' job. Jesus is the one that baptizes people in the Holy Spirit. We pray for this release of grace and the Lord comes through, the Spirit comes through and, and, and great things happen. But it is God's desire and God's will. At one point, you know, uh, um, you know in Acts chapter eight, you know, they, they heard that th th there had people had come to believe in Jesus, had given their hearts to the Lord. And when Peter and John go to them, uh, they, they went down that they might receive uh, the Holy Spirit for it had not yet fallen on them for they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So there was once a time where you were baptized into communion with Christ and then received baptism in the Holy Spirit. So there, there, there's one way we see it. Um, you know, he goes to another place in Acts chapter 19. He says, how were you baptized? And the believers there said, well, we were baptized with the baptism of John for the repentance of sins. And they asked him, uh, were you baptized uh, in the Holy Spirit? And they said, uh, we didn't even know there is a Holy Spirit. <laughs> So catechetical issues <laughs> plague the early church. They're, they're nothing new. But, the, you know, the, the point, and I'll say all this, is that, you know, we, we stand before the Lord, like, without a formula. We can only stand before God with faith and with the expectation that he's going to be who he says he is and do what he says. For me, I was 18 years old, and, um, and I think I shared this yesterday, Maybe I didn't, but I, uh, at 18, I had my major conversion in the confessional. I had uh, witnessed when I was in junior high school, my grandfather dying in a car accident. Happened out in front of the, in the street, out in front of the, uh, the uh, school that I was attending. And I was on the front lawn, his car got hit, burst into flames, spun out of control, ended up on the front lawn of the school. And because of that, my grandmother became an alcoholic. My dad had to take over running two businesses. Um, you know, there's just a lot of turmoil and chaos in my life. I became very angry, angry with my grandmother for her drinking, angry with my dad because he was never around, angry, 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 angry with God. And I kind of shut God down. I mean, I still went through the motions because it's easier to sit in church for an hour zoning out than it is to argue with your parents. <clears throat> And I knew heading into my senior year of high school that my heart was, was miserable, miserable. And I was getting ready to go off to college and it was at this time I went into the confessional and I sat down in front of this priest and he, he said, you know, uh, you know, what do you want to confess? I said, I don't know, I haven't done this in a while. And I hadn't, I hadn't gone to confession since my first confession. He says, well, what is it that you want from the Lord? And I explained to him, I just said, I'm miserable, I'm angry, I, you know, I just... I see everyone else around me on this retreat. They're, they're experiencing God, and I'm experiencing nothing. I'm frustrated. 
And he said, well, why are you on this retreat? And I began to explain and tell my story. This is all that I had gone through. You know, and my sins included, um, you know, lying to my parents, uh, shoplifting, alcohol, smoking weed, uh, dabbled in pornography, uh, you know, a lot of impurity because of that in my life, um, you know, just negative humor and cutting people down. I was sarcastic. I was mean. I was rude, self-centered. I was a complete jackass. You know, if jackass was a mortal sin, I was definitely not going to heaven. <laughs> And as I was confessing these things, I started crying. And the priest, he was very nice. He came forward. He put his hand on my shoulder. And he started tapping. And as I leaned forward, his stole hit, hit my arm or my face. And I grabbed it because I thought he was handing me a handkerchief. And I, <laughs> so I, I actually, at the moment of my conversion, before the Lord zapped me with the Holy Spirit for the first time, hawked a loogie on a priest's stole. So, I mean, like God can work through anything. I still think. And the priest was very cool about it. He laughed. But anyway, when he prayed the prayers of absolution, I, I said, was there anything else you, I need to say? He goes like, because I didn't know the, the, the you know, act of contrition or anything at the time. He just said, are you sorry? He led me through it. I'm like, yeah, I want to be right with God. He goes, do you promise to, to, to live a new life for God? I'm like, I want this new life. So he prayed the prayer of absolution, and it felt like I just came alive, like the paddles had been put to my chest and I'd been brought to life. I walked out of there a, a, a living man, a son of God, a, with a new realization. And it had always had been in me, but it had been awakened in that moment. God came very near to me and breathed his spirit into my lungs. The next morning, the man who founded Net Ministries, because this was a net retreat, came up to me and said, I was praying last night, and I know that the Lord touched you deeply, and I want to invite you to be a missionary with Net in the fall. I'm like, you're kidding me. I just like, I have no formation. I mean, I just finally figured out after 18 years that God is real and that he loves me. And I don't know anything other than that. He said, don't worry, we'll train you. It'll all be good. So I had to go home. And I mean, like, I knew this was what the, I mean, at the second he said, it, I knew this was what God wanted for me. So I went home and I told my parents, I'm not going to college in the fall after all. This was June. I was getting ready to go to college in August. They looked at me. My mom started crying. She was like, did you just join a cult? I'm like, no, mom, these people are Catholic. I mean, but, but I've experienced God's love. And I'm like, I just want to do this for a year. I promise I'll go to college. And my grandmother cried because it was just expected that I'd go to college. Everyone did right out of high school. And, you know, like th this experience was so powerful, but I wouldn't even say like, God would, God would just like start the process. Like, I don't think I had this experience where I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and like everything I needed was given to me in that moment. But I became hungry for more because during that training, I got prayed with and received new graces. And even throughout the year with my team, we would pray with one another and pray over one another. And I could still feel these graces stirring up. I remember the first retreat that I was, that we were doing is it at the small church in northern Minnesota. This was 1983, so the new evangelization and the word evangelization really wasn't part of the Catholic lexicon per se for most Catholics. And when we came to town, the priest said to us, I don't know if we're going to get a lot of kids here. The parents heard that you were an evangelization team. They think you're Protestant. They're keeping their kids home. They're afraid that you're going to take them out of the church. And we're like, really? Did you not explain that we're Catholic evangelization? He goes, I tried. But we did get some kids to show up. And there was one kid in my small group, who, this young man, who was just angry and closed off during the whole retreat. And we do this thing at the end of net where we just, you know, do a little prayer ministry. It's just asking God to bless him because they have this encounter. And we want to ask God to bless him. And this young man sat down in front of me and I asked him, you know, like, what can I pray for you? He was, he's sitting there with his arms closed, looking very sullen, like, nothing. Are you sure? Nothing in particular I can pray for you? No. Well, can I just pray a blessing? Fine. So I put my hand, I said, can I put my hand on your shoulder? So I put my hand on your shoulder and I started praying, come, come Holy Spirit, and bless this young man. And as I started praying for him, I saw this image as clear as a, like a picture being, like curtains opening, and here's this picture of a crossroads, or the railroad crossing on a road in the middle of a cornfield. And I thought, why am I thinking this right now? I was like, I'm trying to clear it out. Okay, so I guess the Lord just bless this young man. You know, and all of a sudden, it was right there again in front of me. And this happened two more times. And finally, I'm like, okay, God, what are you doing? So I just paused, and I just sucked it up and said, okay, God. 
I'll say it. So I, 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 I said to him, I'm praying for you. And every time I start praying, I get this image of a railroad crossing in the middle of a cornfield. Does that mean anything to you? And this kid, just, his face just dropped and he just started bawling. Like a month before this retreat, his dad had been hit in a car by a train and killed at a cross stop. And I was just able to spend a few more minutes praying with him for healing and restoration and forgiveness. And it was like I, I, I walked out of there probably as stunned as the young man did. You know, you're like, oh my gosh, what just happened? God just showed me something that acted like a key to unlock the heart of this young man so that God could pour his mercy and love into his heart. And I asked one of the other guys who's you know, a little older than me, I'm like, has this happened to you before? He goes, oh yeah, that's a spiritual gift. It's like a, a prophetic word or a word of knowledge. And I'm like, God really does this stuff? He goes, yes, God really does this stuff. When we put our faith in there, the power comes and God really does what he says he will do. And it wasn't like I walked out thinking, look what I can do now. I was like trembling. Like, oh my gosh, this God, his power is real. But it just confirmed in my faith that this is what I was supposed to be doing with my life. You know, at age 18, before I went into that confessional and God touched my heart, if you would have asked me what I'd be doing right now, I'd probably say I'd be practicing medicine. I really wanted to be a doctor. I'd been accepted at a, you know, in a pre-med program in Michigan. I was all set to go. I was going to do my undergrad, go to medical school, because I wanted to make money. And medicine was one of those fields where you knew you could make a lot of money. Because I wanted a big house. I wanted a hot wife. I wanted all these things. Instead, the Lord gave me himself, his Holy Spirit. Well, he gave me a hot wife, that's true. Um, <laughs> but I would not have picked this path for my life. Give me, a, give me a, a hundred different options. I would not have picked this path, but God put me on this path, and I'm so grateful. And so, I, I mean, I'd like to share everything. I, I'm going to share tomorrow morning. I, I'm going to be speaking, and I'm going to kind of tell you some of the other things that the Lord has done. But for, for more than anything, what I think I came to realize is that it was in a moment of complete vulnerability when I was dealing with the weight of my sin and I had nowhere else to turn, that I just let my guard down. I completely surrendered and said, okay, Lord, take my sin, take my brokenness and fill me with your light. I want you more than this sin. I want you more than anything. I want your spirit alive in me. I, you know, this surrender, this complete emptying was in that complete feeling of poverty and having nothing before the Lord that the Lord was able to break into my heart and do something amazing. And I think, you know, one of the things that the Lord wants to do is oftentimes, and you probably have felt like this maybe at times during the, this year, is he invites us to go on to the cross with him, right? And to strip us. You think of Jesus being stripped of his flesh, being scourged. And the Lord invites that into us into that. Like, I want to strip away some layers. I want to strip some of the old man away. Some of that worldliness, some of that sin of the flesh or some of those fears. I want to strip you. I want to strip you and I want to leave you hanging naked because in your vulnerability, you're going to cry out to me and commend your spirit to me in such a way that I'm going to move in power. And it's the most unpleasant feeling in the world to go through a scourging by the spirit, to be stripped. And so many of us had things taken from our lives this past year. It really felt like a continual scourging for many people. But we know for Christ, all of his suffering ended in resurrection and new life. And I would contend that that's how God is going to end this for you t today, this through the rest of this retreat, is whatever you've endured for him and had to suffer th for him, he wants to then, you know, in, a, in a much greater generous act, pour his Holy Spirit out upon you. But what I want to do as we wrap up here, we're going to spend some time praying is I just want you to, to think about not everything that God wants to do. God already knows what he wants to do and what he wants to give you, how he wants to bless you. I think what we want to do for the last few minutes is just take some time to pray and say, okay, God, where am I holding back? What have you been trying to strip from me that I haven't let go of yet? What is my struggle that, that is the thing that I'm hanging on to that I know I don't need? that you're inviting me to let go of? Is it my pride? Is it another layer of my pride? Because, you know, most of us 
no, I gave up my pride. Well, there's another layer. Peel that onion. Keep peeling that onion of pride. There's always another layer. Okay, Lord, if it's another layer of my pride, take that. If it's uh, my dependence on, you know, my, my binging alcohol, is it binging television? Is it binging whatever it is that we're, you know, that we're just using to, to kind of medicate us ourselves to help us get through these days? Let me let go of those crutches and let me cling to you, Lord. Even if I have to let go of those crutches and crawl to you, Jesus, I will do that. Because I know once I'm with you and you, you, I have you, have you and you have me in your arms, I'm going to be healed. So let's just pray. Come Holy Spirit.